All right, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for making a special effort to be here. Not all of the Caskey Center recipients are able to attend this session because some of them are bivocational ministers and they work. Uh, they have real jobs and uh, they're not able to come during the morning hours. And so they'll be watching this by video. So we are videoing this. If for some reason you need to get up uh, before the end of the session, please exit to the side aisle so uh, we'll be able to get a good video. Dr. Kelly is going to be joining us in a few moments. And uh, I've been here eight and a half years serving on faculty. And basically the faculty rule is when Dr. Kelly walks in, we turn it over to the president at that time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. But uh, when he comes in, he does want to greet you all and, and uh, share with you his passion for the Caskey Center. So. Welcome, we're glad you're here. We're gonna to try to make really good use of our time together. We're gonna to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. We wanna make sure you understand how the program works, especially how the evangelism practicum works. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning uh, desperate for you. Lord, we need you. We recognize, Lord, that we always are in need of you. Even for our very next breath, we're dependent upon you. But there are times that we are more aware, we're more conscious of our need for you. And Lord, today we just want to tell you, Lord, that we need you, we love you, we thank you for your great love for us. Thank you, Father, for calling us to yourself in Christ Jesus. Thank you for calling us to serve you and follow you. We recognize, Lord, that you don't really even need us, but you want to use us and you want to make us usable. So we're privileged and we thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we get to serve together, that we need you and we need each other. And so, Lord, I just pray that we'll be encouraged as we come together today. Thank you for our seminary family. Thank you for the Caskey Center for Church Excellence and our very generous donors that have made this possible. And uh, just encourage us and teach us the things you brought us here to learn today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, welcome. I'm Dr. Talbert. I'm the director of the Caskey Center for Church Excellence. And um, we have graduate and undergraduate students here today. And, uh, but just to get a feel for who's here, let me ask you, how many of you are serving churches in Louisiana? Louisiana churches, okay, that's most of them. Any Mississippi ministers here today? Good, great state of Mississippi. We're gonna be adding folks from uh, Alabama beginning in January. So the center just continues to expand. How many of you, this is going to be your first semester as a Caskey Center recipient, and you're excited, amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. The Caskey Center for Church Excellence was launched in April of last year, uh, about a year and a half ago, and the intent at the outset was we were going to be offering up to 100, up to 100 full tuition scholarships for those serving in Louisiana Baptist churches, but we decided not to do that. We're going to do more than that because of the blessing of the Lord and our very generous donors we are now offering 244 full tuition scholarships amen and that wonderful praise the Lord and this is all about being an encouragement to you in your ministry we want to help uh, encourage you in the path that God's set for you to follow him and serve him and if we can just lift a little bit of the financial burden we want to do that uh, the real heart of our donors is to assist you in your ministry. There are two passions that our donors have, and that is one is that you be biblically grounded, biblically founded in your ministry, whether it's a ministry of preaching or teaching or worship or children's ministry or whatever it is. We want it to be have direct biblical authority. We want you to be on a very short leash with the Word of God. And so we want you to be very biblically grounded in His Word. People's lives are transformed by the Word of God. They're not transformed by your wonderful personality or your charm or your good looks. Aren't you glad it isn't dependent on your good looks? Some of you ought to say amen right there for that one. But people's, li people's, lives, people's lives are transformed by the Word of God. And so we just want you to really have that as a real conviction in your ministry. The other thing is we want you to have a very clear commitment to personal evangelism. One of the things that is sad but true, even those of us that are in ministry, if we're not paying attention to personal evangelism, we can actually drift 
in our practice of personal evangelism. We don't intend to do that. That's not a decision that we make. We can just tend to drift from it. But we need to understand that people need the Lord and they need the gospel and they need spokesmen if they're going to come to faith in Christ. I was reading uh, this last week in my quiet time through the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10. Uh, Paul is talking about his burden, his passion for his countrymen, Israel, to be saved. And let's know what Paul says. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 1. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. And then he says, this is very interesting, verse 2, For I testify about them that they have a zeal of God, but not in accordance with knowledge. God has placed eternity in the hearts of people. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that. God's placed eternity in their hearts. And so there's a spiritual understanding, there's a spiritual awareness that God has placed in every person. But many times it's not in accordance with knowledge. It's just their speculation or what they can imagine about God. And so that's why further down in Romans chapter 10, it says, but if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. And then he says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And so the connection between God's love and man's redemption is the witness, is the gospel witness. It's like in Acts chapter 8, we read about Philip, who God sent to that Ethiopian eunuch who was reading the Bible. He was reading the, uh, the scroll of Isaiah. In fact, he was reading it out loud. As Philip comes up, it says he, he heard him reading from the law of God. And he asked him, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And that lost person asked a great question. He said, how can I unless someone guides me? Now, I know there are people that get saved by reading a Gideon Bible in a hotel room all by themselves. But most of the time, a person that comes to faith in Christ, it's because God places a Christian in their path to guide them, to give them encouragement. My wife and I went out to eat uh, Wednesday night. Or we yeah, Wednesday night. Uh, and we practice what I call Epicurean evangelism. We witness to our waitress. And uh, so we were at our favorite restaurant, and a, a real sweet little girl came over named Nikki, and we told her that we'd like to pray for her when we prayed for our food, and we asked how we could pray for her. She said, you know, it's really interesting that you would ask me that. She said, I've been thinking about God more often lately. And she said, it seems like when I think about God, I, it's like I feel a wind blowing. And so that's just teeing it up for evangelism, Professor, when you say something like that. And I said, well, Nikki, I'll tell you what, after we have our meal, I want to talk to you about that wind. And uh, so she said, okay. So we finished our meal, and she came to the table, and she said, I want you to tell me about that wind. So I got to talk to her about Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is like a wind. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. Uh, but I got to share, move into the gospel, talk about our need for forgiveness, talk about Jesus, how he came to provide that forgiveness for us by his death on the cross. We had a great gospel-centered conversation. But I would, I would challenge you that that doesn't come automatically to most of us. In fact, if I can just be honest with you, nobody here but us, that doesn't come naturally to me. I have to be intentional about sharing my faith in Christ. I can be so much like the Apostle Paul who said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when I came to you, I was in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Can I get a witness? That's, that's most of us. The reason most of us don't share our faith in Christ more often is because of the weakness of the flesh. Paul said, I came to you in weakness. And because of the fear of man, he said, I came to you in fear. And then that just leads to much trembling. And so Paul even asked the church at Ephesus in, in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, pray for me that I will open my mouth. That's one of the secrets to personal evangelism, by the way. Open your mouth and proclaim the gospel with boldness as I ought to. And so what we're doing in this class is just encouraging you 
to be very intentional about sharing your faith in Christ. Let me tell you what happened last year through the Caskey Center. Those that uh, received the scholarship, that was some of you. Those of you that are new, let me tell you what happened last year. Because of the students that were enrolled in uh, the Caskey Center program, graduates and undergraduates, they had, our students had 3,319 gospel-centered conversations. Now that's not just a spiritual conversation. That's not just inviting somebody to come to church. That is a gospel-centered conversation. And a gospel-centered conversation is where we are looking for an opportunity to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day. And he says that's the gospel. So 3,319 gospel-centered conversations. Of those, 3,300, 2,179 of those got so deep into the gospel that there was a call for response 2,100 times. And of those 2,100 times, we had 456 people indicate that they were trusting Christ as their personal Savior. Now, that's not just an academic exercise. That's not just a scholarship requirement. That's kingdom impact. Now, here's what that breaks down to. That means that if you have a spiritual conversation with someone during this next year, about 13% of the time, you're gonna likely see somebody indicate a desire to receive Christ, about 13% of the time. When the gospel is presented with a call for response, we saw a profession of faith over 20% of the time. So that's one out of five. Now, the Bible says if we sow sparingly, we're gonna reap sparingly. But it says if we sow abundantly, we're going to do what? We're going to reap abundantly. So we're going to be asking you to sow. Without any apology, we're going to be asking you to do that. We're going to be asking you to have what I call that a Monday morning prayer this fall and next spring. And your Monday morning prayer is going to look like this. Lord, who's it going to be this week that I get to share the gospel with? Show me who it is. First couple of weeks of the semester, you may know exactly who it's going to be. You've been needing to talk to them anyway. So this is gonna be your excuse to talk to those folks. You may get to about week three or four and you don't have any idea who it's gonna be. Well, you're gonna be praying a very desperate Monday morning prayer. Lord, I don't know who it is, but I'm looking for that person. Put them in my path. Show me who it is that I can initiate that gospel-centered conversation with. Frankly, I think that might be a prayer we ought to pray every day, but we're talking about every Monday morning. And then you pray that prayer all week long looking for that person with whom you can share Christ. We're not requiring you to lead a certain number of people to faith in Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We're not requiring you to baptize a certain number of people. We hope that will happen and you'll be baptizing folks in your church. But without any apology, we are going to be requiring you to sow the seed of the gospel. I will tell you, quite frankly, when I went into the ministry right out of college, I was with a student ministry, worked with college students, and with, with an organization known as CREW. It used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ. And we were required to have 15 gospel-centered conversations a week. So we're talking about one gospel-centered conversation a week as a part of this program. Uh, I think that's entirely reasonable, but I will tell you it's got to be intentional. If you're not intentionally focused on that, it, it just won't happen. When I pray that Monday morning prayer, it's amazing how God leads me to somebody. When I don't pray that prayer, I can't find a lost person anywhere. So we're talking about being very, very deliberate and very, very intentional. And quite honestly, I, I would like to see this become so a part of your ministry and so a part of your life that when you leave this program and you don't need a scholarship anymore, that's going to be your Monday morning prayer for the rest of your life. It's just going to be a part of your culture and who you are. So that's what we're talking about. Um, we've expanded now, as I said, into uh, Mississippi and beginning in January in Alabama. And uh, I, I do need to let you know that as our program becomes larger, it's going to be extremely important that you comply with the requirements of this program. Uh, we've, we've been launching a new program and we've been sort of building the airplane as we take off and that's exciting. But we're to the point now that I, I just need to let you know it's going to be extremely important that you understand what's expected of you as a Caskey Center recipient. You clearly understand what the requirements are and that you keep those reports up. We're going to be talking about that in just a moment. 
that you make sure those conversations are gospel-centered conversations um, and that you meet those deadline requirements. Uh, we want to be an encouragement to you. We want this to be a positive motivation in your life. Uh, but quite honestly, the donors are expecting us to maintain this program and communicate these guidelines. They're expecting that of us as directors, and so we're going to be expecting that of you. Is that fair enough that you understand what's expected and that you meet those requirements? Okay. Um, how many of you are graduate students? You're working on a master's degree. Okay, let me talk to you for just a moment. Uh, the syllabus for the uh, graduate practicum is on Blackboard. It's EVAN 5131. It's now on Blackboard. So you, if you haven't seen that already, you need to go to that and make sure you understand that. Uh, the the uh, basic uh, requirements that we're looking for you uh, to uh, keep after today is one week from today, that's September the 11th, you are to declare your gospel presentation that method that you're going to use, whether it's a Roman road, whether it's the three circles, whether it's a conversational approach, whether it's a booklet approach, we need for you to share with us what your typical gospel presentation is going to be. So you're to declare that to us within one week. The deadline for that is September the 11th. And then the next week, two weeks from today, you begin presenting your evangelism reports. The first one is due September the 19th. And then they're due each week, uh, 12 weeks throughout the uh, fall semester. Uh, the last week is December the 12th. We, that's going to be a really hard deadline. I'm just going to tell you. December the 12th is going to be a very firm deadline for you to have all 12 of your evangelism reports in. Now, we don't want you to do 12 evangelistic presentations the last week. We really want you to do it one a week. We want this to be a lifestyle for you. So we're going to be looking for those reports each week. Those are due on Blackboard. Uh, my grading assistant is here. We'll say a word to you about that. And then your textbook report uh, is due toward the end of the semester. It's due December the 5th. Uh, there's a required textbook. If you're new in Caskey, first semester, there's a required textbook we ask you to read. If you've already read that or, or you're in a second or third semester, you choose one of the books on the alternative list. We need to, to know which one you've chosen. You need to declare that to us. A few of you have asked if you can use an alternative book. We, uh, we will look at that. We will consider an alternative reading. If there's something that you want to read, we'll consider that. It needs to be something that you want to read, not something you've already read. Okay, we want it to be current. So those basically are the three things that, uh, that are going to be the course requirements for the evangelism. It's the evangelism reports, the reading report, and your um, preferred method of evangelism. Uh, be sure you follow that very, very closely. Uh, my grader and uh, TA is Ryan Ralston. He basically is the one that deals with those reports as they come in, and he's going to come in a few moments to make you understand some things that he's observed, things that are really helpful, things that you need to avoid mistakes students have made. So. We're going to kind of help you learn from other people's past experience. But I do want you to understand the gospel presentation is not just a spiritual conversation. It's not just telling somebody God loves you. It's not just an invitation to church. It's getting deeper into the gospel, really sharing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Folks need a forgiveness and what God has provided for us in Jesus Christ. We're not requiring you to do it a certain way. But it does need to be a clear, straightforward, un intentional, unapologetic presentation of the gospel where you're moving toward a call to a response. It also needs to be in a personal encounter. This is not a sermon. This is not a Sunday school lesson. Uh, if someone comes to you during an altar call, during an invitation, I'm a big advocate of the public invitation. I did my doctoral work on the public invitation. But if someone comes and talks to you at the end of the service, that basically is related to a public proclamation event. And so if you're talking to someone at the altar, that's wonderful. I'll do that. But that does not meet the requirement for Caskey. Caskey is to be personal evangelism. It can be done on your church campus. It can be if someone schedules an appointment to come in and talk with you. It doesn't have to be away from the church field. It can be at Starbucks, McDonald's, any way you want to do it, but it needs to be in a personal encounter, a personal gospel-centered conversation, okay? Let me just 
pause right there because this is extremely important that you understand what we're asking. Once a week, a gospel-centered conversation with someone with a, with a view to calling for a response. Is there anything about that that I need to clarify? Or you have a question or what about this? If you have that question, somebody else may have it also. So let me try to answer it if I can. Any questions about that? Uh, yes, I, I Charles? Now, I, I did misunderstand your man. I spoke to you. Uh, response is not given. Response is not given. We, we need to submit that in the report or the required to submit the response is given. Okay, the question is, if, if they don't really respond, if you don't get a clear response, can that count? And the answer is yes. Uh, the strict requirement is that it's a gospel-centered conversation where you are presenting the gospel to an individual. It is with a view, it is with the intent of calling for a response. Last year, 30, we had 3,300 gospel-centered conversations. Two out of three, there was a call for a response. Okay. So we want you to be working toward that, aiming toward that. You may not be able to quite get to that, or they may cut you off, and you may not actually get to call for a response. But that's your intent. That's where you're planning to go. Uh, it doesn't have to have a, cl a clear response from the other person, although that's what we're wanting you to be aiming toward and working toward. That's a good question. Any other questions about that? Okay, so that's the graduate um, requirement. Of those 12 reports, three of those, once a month, is to be a narrative. So it's not 12 reports plus three narratives. Of those 12, three of them are to be full narratives of verbatim. Basically, I said this, and she said this, and I said this, and she said this. Okay, so once a month, it's a full narrative. The other reports are completing a form that we're going to talk to you about in just a moment. Okay, let me ask Dr. Farmer to come. Dr. Jeff Farmer is the associate director and he's over the undergraduate program, so he wants to share with you just a little bit of difference or nuance. How many of you are undergraduate students? Okay, you listen carefully to Dr. Farmer. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Talbert. I'm very excited to see y'all here. I'm very excited to see men and women who are committed to serving Christ in the, their ministry setting, to further their education, and are willing to be obedient to go out and make disciples. Man, that's very encouraging. Uh, there's not a whole lot to add to what Dr. Talbert has said. He's been very thorough. I do want to emphasize something about prayer in evangelism. Our role is to share the gospel, to tell the truth the good news entails. But we can't tell the truth without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So in your gospel presentation, you need to be bathed in prayer. People will not understand that message unless God is working in their lives. And so they need to be bathed in prayer. A good habit that I encourage my students to take up is it's a little involved initially but to take about two hours pray and ask God to reveal to you people in your life in your sphere of influence we call it the oikos within your household those people that you know and that already trust you when you talk to them and ask God of the people within my oikos who do I know who is either not saved or I'm not sure that they're saved? And then make a list. Make a list of a hundred people that you're going to target for prayer and to share the gospel with. Now, if you find someone on that list that, that it turns out they are believers, uh, they're just not uh, very active, um, we rejoice. Hey, they're believers. Outstanding. And this, is, this gives an opportunity to uh, encourage them towards a, a, a greater uh, relationship with Christ. Can't count that for your um, uh, witnessing report. However, every week I pick five people off my list. 
And it starts at 100. Sometimes it, it goes down because people hear the gospel and are saved, um, or I meet new people, so it fluctuates, but more or less right around 100. Pick five people each week and pray that the Holy Spirit would work in their lives, that they would hear and know the gospel and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if God uses you to do that, and, and these are a great list of people to use for our Caskey Challenge every Monday morning. God, from our list of, of 100, which one would you have me talk to today? Prayer is vitally important. Prayer is the fuel. The car won't go without the fuel. And sharing the gospel without being bathed in prayer is just talking. Okay, so I want to emphasize the value of prayer. Um, the requirements for the undergraduate students is very similar, but just a little bit different than the graduate program. As with the graduates, you will be required to share the gospel once a week and, ha and turn in no less than 12 witnessing encounters. If you'd like to turn in more than that, we're okay with that. That's fine. Um, just like with the graduate students, you will read one book. <clears throat> the first semester, it's Share Jesus Without Fear by Bill Fay. After that, and this is where the, the syllabus has uh, caused some confusion with some people. We've asked that you would read each text in numerical order. And the list in the subsequent semester's list begins with number one, which makes it difficult because it's not your first semester, it's your second. Just go with it, all right? So the first book I read after my first semester will be uh, Dave Early and Dave Wheeler's Evangelism Is, How to Share Jesus with Passion and Confidence. And then you go on to the Michael Green book and then the Wayne McDill book. And I've got a total of nine. That works out to be about four and a half years. Uh, if you need more, we'll work on it. Um, <laughs> and then finally, the, uh, the narrative account. Whereas Dr. Tolbert said that once a month, the graduate students do it. Undergraduates, you only have to do it one time for the semester, okay? The book review and the narrative account both are due by December 5th. You could turn it in tomorrow and that would be perfectly all right. Um, my uh, grading assistant would, would be very appreciative. Um, and stand up, Larry. Larry Johnson is a, a graduate Caskey uh, student and is doing the exact same thing that, that we're asking our undergraduates. He will be grading for the, uh, the undergraduate programs. Okay, thanks, you can sit down now. Um, and uh, so getting it in early, it'll help you so that you can focus on other, other assignments this semester and it'll help my grader, as he, he will be doing the same. Um, one other thing, we, uh, The Caskey Center for Church Excellence is not just about providing a scholarship for y'all, though that is the most popular resource we provide, is it not? Yep, we like that. Um, we're in the process of setting up research that will provide resources and provide um, learning and white papers to help bivocational and smaller membership pastors to uh, conduct their, their ministries well. Um, we're striving towards excellence, not just in our own church, but in all the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention. And so one longitudinal study that we're involved in is we're looking at the impact of both higher education and the Caskey requirement of evangelism, what that has on the local church, the Caskey churches. We have already pulled the annual church profile information for the last couple of years so that we can get a, a, a base understanding of the churches. But now we need your help. Every September, your association, or sometimes it's the state conventions, will send out a packet for the annual church profile. And it's something that pastors 
probably don't pay a whole lot of attention to. The church clerk handles it most times. Um, unfortunately, there are a good number of churches that just don't do it, um, but they should. They should. It helps us as a, a denomination take the, the temperature, the health of our denomination, and identify areas where we need to be uh, improving um, or helping churches to improve. The problem with the annual church profiles being submitted, and, and we want you to submit them, turn them into the state association, the state convention or the association office. Um, typically, a lot of associations and, and state conventions have gone to doing it online. Um, and that's great. We, we want that there. However, I would also like you to make a copy of it and send the copy to me. Because what happens is your church sends that information to the state convention. They send it to Lifeway Research. And then they compile it and they adjust it. They man manipulate it to, to be in a presentable format. And then it's not available to us, the researchers, until usually about the middle of June. So if you can get it to me in September or early October, then we have a jump on the research and we can identify things. The next step in that is not just to identify the numerical issues, but to identify certain churches and do case studies on those churches. And so you'll see me and, and we would have conversations and uh, uh, interviews to see what your church is doing well. And so that, that, that's down the road. Right now, ask your church clerk or your pastor or yourself, if you're the one who, who completes the annual church profile, to make a copy before sending it off and just send it into our office, and I'd appreciate that. Okay? I see Dr. Kelly is here. I would like to invite Dr. Kelly to come up and, and to share a word of welcome, if you would. Welcome to NOBTS and to the Caskey program. I don't think I can find a way to help you fully understand how important you are, but I am going to give it a shot. The key to the future of the Southern Baptist Convention is what happens in your churches right now. It's more important than what's happening in First Baptist Church Orlando, Woodstock Baptist Church, First Baptist Church Dallas. We have some of the greatest churches in the history of Christendom that are doing ministry right now in just a fabulous ways. I mean, they're, they're just great churches. Have you seen the wildfire revival sweeping the nation? Are you seeing the whole Southern Baptist Convention being elevated by the performance of those churches? They're doing things that are impossible for most of our churches to be able to do. Thank God for them. But their models cannot be reproduced so that we have a First Baptist Dallas in every county in the United States. It, it, it's not happening. It's not ever going to happen. Your churches are the key to the future of the Southern Baptist Convention. What can we do as ministers in churches like yours, not to reach people by the thousands, but to reach people by the ones and twos, the fives, the sixes? The most important evangelism goal, I think, in the SBC would be if churches like yours set a goal of baptizing 12 people a year. Do you have any idea how that would revolutionize the impact of the Southern Baptist Convention on our nation? So your churches are the key to the future of the Southern Baptist Convention. For that reason, we have uh, a donor family who just who, who loves you, loves the idea of you. They don't know you, but they love who you are because they understand these churches are the heart of the Southern Baptist Convention, and they really appreciate that. But they also have a deep concern for reaching our nation for Christ, and they understand we're not going to be able to do that unless we learn how to be fruitful in churches like yours. 
And towards that end, they've, they've tried to set in motion two things. One is to give you the very best of training so that you have access to the very best of training in an outstanding seminary and you can pick any undergraduate or master's degree that you want to pick and they will pay the tuition and fees for that. They want you to feel like I can get the training. Anybody, it doesn't matter if I have a rich family or a big church, I can get the training anybody else can get and I get to pick the training that I think will most help me. <laughs> wow, I'm just so thrilled about that. The second thing they want is for you to really get comfortable explaining the gospel to people in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And Dr. Talbert is talking with you about that. And I will tell you, that is a, a deep desire on the part of the donors who are making this possible. Because they know we don't need to reach people by the thousands. We need to reach them by the ones and the twos. And that will become thousands. And where the real labor of the gospel, where the real firing line is for penetrating our nation with the gospel is your church. Okay? The third thing that we want to do, and this is what Dr. Farmer was talking with you about, we just want to look over your shoulder at what's happening. And that's for several reasons. And, and giving us that information really does matter because we want to see, first of all, does getting seminary training help people in any kinds of ways. And we want to watch what happens in your church as you go through a degree program at the seminary and see if we can tell, is there any way we're helping? To, because we can replicate that. Or if we see an area where we thought this would help but it's not making much difference, maybe we need to adjust this or adjust that in our curriculum. And you're going to help us design our curriculum just by sharing that with us because our target is healthy churches. And with you, we have a group that we can see, okay, you're a seminary student, you're going through a degree, does that seem to be affecting your church or is it just affecting you? Is there anything we can do to help it be more effective? The other thing it lets us do is if you find something that is helping you reach people for Christ in your community, we can pass that word up and down the line. Because I want to tell you, there are hundreds of guys in churches like yours who could really benefit if you discover a way to reach people or better disciple people or something like that in your context. And they won't have to make any huge adjustments. They can just kind of plug it right in because your church is a lot like their churches. So we're, we're really counting on you. Uh, our donors do not want to support you because they feel sorry for you poor little minister in a poor little church, nobody cares about you, want to hug you. Okay, they love you, but they also know you matter. You matter strategically. We can't advance as a whole convention if we don't advance in churches like yours. It's the key. I'll tell you all that so you will know I am very serious when I say we are praying for you. And we are very interested in you. And we want you to talk to us. We want you to help us know what's really helping in your seminary experience. What's making a difference for you? How do you see yourself changing and growing? Is there something that you wish we talked more about as you go through? We really want you to talk to us and give us feedback. We really want you to talk to us about your churches too. And let us just kind of look over your shoulder and hear your insights, because this is the key to the future for most Southern Baptist churches and the people who are in them and the communities in which they are located. We're grateful for you. We are proud of you. We are excited about being able to serve you, and we're going to do with excellence. So this is what we need from you. Two words. Diligence. Don't waste this opportunity. Give it your best shot. Really try to learn. Don't just get a piece of paper and a handshake from me. Really learn and grow. Don't waste this. Okay, there are a lot of people who go through their whole life, they'll never have the chance that you've got. Don't waste it. Give it diligence. 
the second thing that we need from you, diligence. The second thing, courage. I will tell you from many years of teaching evangelism on our seminary campus that preachers and other staff members are some of the most frightened people in the world about engaging in one-on-one -on -one conversations about Jesus. So if you find yourself a little intimidated by that, it doesn't mean you don't love Jesus as much as you wish you did, okay? This is not about that doesn't mean you're uncommitted or you're weird or you're strange. Nah. Welcome. Same way for me. Same way for Dr. Talbert. Welcome. That's just part of it. The difference comes in maybe feeling some hesitation, some uncertainty uh, about starting that conversation, about engaging the gospel and actually using the word repent when you're talking to somebody. Okay, it, it, it takes courage to understand this is a work of the Holy Spirit that he's doing through you. So it's okay. Just do it. Just open your mouth and speak. Use the chances God gives you. I think you're going to find yourself starting to notice opportunities that maybe you didn't really notice before. But just have courage. And if you feel a little intimidated and if you feel a little overwhelmed and if you feel afraid, Welcome to my world. It's okay. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is obedience anyway. Okay? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is obedience anyway. So just jump in. Take that Caskey challenge and see what God does. That's all we ever do when we open our mouth to speak about Jesus. We see what God does. I believe that you've got some wonderful, wonderful times ahead of you. For God to work in your life in a wonderful way, teaching you, growing you, I, you're really going to enjoy the things that you learn and do. You're going to work hard. There's no painless way to get a degree. But I really covet for you the work of the Holy Spirit through your witness as you simply make that commitment each week I want to tell one person about Jesus this week and I pray that God will use you in a great and a wonderful way can I pray for you before I have to run Heavenly Father thank you so much for these men and women thank you for the calling that you have placed on their lives thank you for the purposes and plans that you have for them Thank you for being a God who is not only great, indescribable in power and glory, but so intimate and personal that you know our names and you know the color of our eyes and you know what our favorite flavor of ice cream is. Thank you for these men and women and thank you for your knowledge of them and your purposes for them. And Father, I stand with them before your throne and I simply pray asking you, to maximize this opportunity in their lives. Do mark their souls on this journey. Do speak to them and teach them and do use them. And Father, I pray that this will be the source for that spark, that fire, that will spread through churches in the SBC until that day comes when we look around and we are in the midst of a mighty act of God. You have always been a God who loves and cherishes small things. Help each of us to understand we must be obedient, we must be faithful, because small things are big things in your plans and in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. We hope you have a wonderful journey along the way. Thank you, Dr. Talbert, for letting me come and speak. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, let me shift gears a bit. Um, those of you that are new in the program this semester, another benefit of the Caskey program is the Logos Bible software. Those of you that have been in the program already and have received Logos as a gift, have you found that helpful? It's, it's awesome. It's an awesome tool. If this is your first semester, let me tell you how Logos is going to work. We always wait and award it at the end of drop ad week, and that's this week. So next week, those of you that have not received Logos yet, we will be sending your name and your email address to Logos. They will process that. 
We don't know exactly how long that will take. Probably, probably no more than about two weeks. It might be quicker than that. But they will send you a link to your email address that you click on that link and that will download Logos to your computer. Uh, we will send you an email to tell you to be watching for that. We've had that go out before and students didn't open the link. So we'll let you know when that's coming. You can open that. You're allowed to download that to all of your devices. You can put that on your desktop, your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone, all of those devices. But it is to be for your use only. So the license is in your name. Logos will be yours to use as long as you're in the CASCI program. If you, if you forfeit the scholarship, if you have to leave school for whatever reason and you leave the CASCI program, then you will lose the use of the Logos software. But if you stay with the program, what we're wanting to do is at graduation, we will award you the license and it'll be yours to keep. So there's another incentive to graduate, okay. And the Logos is gonna be something that you're gonna find extremely helpful in your ministry and your classwork as well as in your church. Okay, I'm gonna ask Lorian uh, to come. Lorian is uh, our uh, administrative assistant and she has a couple of things that she needs to go over with you in terms of housekeeping items. All right, just some quick updates on housekeeping. Uh, one of those he was talking about the processing that we go through at the beginning of the semester and some of the older students may know about this but newer students may be a little confused. So just to give you an overview, um, the Caskey Scholarship doesn't show up the same way that traditional financial aid does here at NOBTS. So if you get on your account and you notice you don't have anything listed for anticipated aid, do not worry. <laughs> it does not mean that you've lost your scholarship. Um, much like he was talking about with the Logos, we wait until after the drop ad period. So the business office will run reports after today and get your account settled. But it does not mean that you have Failed to turn something in or there are any other requirements that you need to meet. Um, along with that, while we're talking about Logos, also know that we do not have access to your account, um, but they are definitely ready and able to help you with any questions you may have. So if you call us, um, we would love to help you, but we won't have access to it. So just make sure that you get online, call their helpline, give them your name and the email address that we have on file for you, and they will be able to help you with anything if a computer crashes or a download link just doesn't work, they're gonna be the ones to help you. Um, let's see here, make sure I get everything covered. Maximum per year, maximum dollar amount. Okay, um, yes, so the max per academic year is $6,000. So that can be used over the course of the fall semester, the spring semester, the summer, however you choose to use that, it is up to you. But that is the max and we'll be holding to that strictly. Now, if you go above that, you can pay the difference, um, but we will not be exceeding that $6,000 max for the academic year. So just know that as you plan out your school and activities for the year. Um, just to also highlight again, something that Dr. Talbert said, we will have to hold to deadlines very, very strictly. Um, that's beyond just even our center here, but also for us to be in compliance with the school's deadlines and policies and procedures. So especially with us growing, um, we will have to hold those very strictly. So no, if we send you an email, we're not trying to be mean, but we're glad you're in the program. We wanna make sure that we can keep you in the program. Um, so that's why you will receive those emails and reminders from us. Please keep those <laughs> at the forefront of what needs to be done. Um, also with that too, we need your updated information. We do that once a year, but we know some things change. So if a phone number changes, an email changes, we can't pull that out of the air. We need that from you. So please, please, please make sure that you give us any changes to your contact information. Um, now also with that thank you notes, uh, just to remind you that again, we're gonna hold strictly to the deadline for that in the future. It's one for academic year and um, just to explain that even more, beyond giving you an opportunity to say thank you, it's also an opportunity for us to pray for you. Just as it has already been shared today, we want to encourage you, we want to be able to pray for you as an office and all the exciting things that go on in your family and in your ministry, but beyond that, the donors want to do that as well. They want to encourage you with this education, they want to encourage you 
in your personal evangelism, but they also want to be your prayer warriors. So getting those thank you notes in in a timely manner is beyond giving an opportunity for thanks, but making sure that we are encouraging you with prayer as much as we possibly can. So please uh, take the time to do those. I know there's been some confusion too about the requirement for avoiding personal identification information. You can include your name, that's fine. Um, we just request that you not include maybe your email account and phone number and those type of identification pieces, um, but name is fine. And let's see, my phone's trying to die. I think that is it as far as housekeeping. The other thing I need for you today um, to do is to make sure that you sign in. We passed it around a bit at the beginning. It's up here now. So if you can just make sure that you sign your name by your name, we'll be good to go. If you have any questions, feel free to stop by the office or give us a call. We definitely want to help you. Um, just let us know. Okay. I'm going to ask Ryan Rawson to come. Ryan is the uh, grader for the graduate course. And I wanted him just to share with you some things that he has observed, uh, things that have been very helpful in the reports, and then some uh, common problems or errors to avoid. Right. I'll start by giving you some positive things to think about. Um, again, with the 456 salvations, that is amazing. What's even more amazing is uh, people are talking about their churches are starting to catch the fire for evangelism. Um, that's exciting for me. And I'm, gonna give you, I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. There are multiple times when I get your evangelism reports and I'm, I'm reading over them on the graduate side and, and I weep because it touches me so much um, to see the gospel being spread. So I want to tell you publicly, thank you for, um, for your hard work. Um, let me give you a couple things just to work on and to keep in, in the future. Um, if you do the evangelism early in the week, it's going to make it easier for you because if you're waiting till Friday and it's due Saturday at midnight, you're going to be rushed to have an encounter with somebody. And what I try to do every time I share the gospel is I try to not only share the gospel, but get to know the person. Um, and I just want to share a brief story with you. I, I met some guys down in the French Quarter. I talked with them for almost an hour and got to be their friend and share the gospel with them. A guy came up, started cussing at me, yelling at me. I don't want to hear anything about Jesus, all this stuff. The people I just shared with looked at the guy and said, Shut up, man. Listen to what he's telling you. He's a really nice guy, and he's telling us some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> and it, it was amazing to have that, um, that opportunity. So make sure that you are kind with the people and not just a check mark or a grade um, for you. I'm going to show you a new form in just a second, but when I show you that form, be sure to fill out the entire form. If you don't get a response, just like Charles was asking about, there's a spot on the form to say no response. I need to know if there was a response. Because as we collect this information, I can show this some things to Dr. Farmer. Dr. Farmer and I can talk about it. And we can better serve you in saying, hey, this person needs to transition from the gospel to a call to repentance better. So these little things that the forum has on it help us to help you. Uh, some of you talk to people on a multiple basis. If you talk with the same person, please say, hey, I talked with this person. Um, I know this is week six. I talk with them on, on week three. Please let me know if it's the same person. Okay, that, that helps as well. If you miss um, a day, make it up on that week. Don't give me a form and it has three people on it because um, they're trying to make up a past week. But if you miss a week, go back and submit a form for that week because here's what happens. In the grade book, it shows a zero. At the end of the semester when we compile everything, I have to submit a list of names to Dr. Tolbert on who did the reports, who was on time, and how well were they done. You don't want to be the person that submitted 12 in one week and go, oh my gosh, I lost my scholarship because I wasn't faithful all semester to do it, and I waited till the last minute. Okay, so do it every week and make it up as well. A couple of things that we forgot to say was that Dr. Farmer and I are working on surveys to send out to you. Please, please do those surveys. Um, this is not something that is put into the requirements, but good golly, it helps you. It helps us understand you. Um, if you need help, let us know. There was a student last semester who missed, I think, what, like the first six weeks uh, due to some confusion and, and told us, he said, I'm scared. I'm scared. 
So Dr. Tolbert went out with him and started sharing the gospel, and the guy told me, he said, I feel confident now that I can go out and share the gospel. So if that's you, let us know. Dr. Tolbert will go out with you. I will go out with you. Dr. Farmer will go out with you. We will also visit your church. We'll come to your church and, and speak with you there. I'm going to go through the form real quick and show you how to get it on Blackboard. If you look at the screen here, um, you have content, and this is under the content tab. It's the new form. Okay, so let me show you what the new form is. We are, um, can you scroll down through there for me? I'm starting with a new form, and notice I said put a number in each box to represent each interaction that you have, if it's more than one. So say you, you met someone at a location, you met two people at a sporting event. Put the letter, or the, not the letter, put the number two in there. Don't just give me a check, okay, because sometimes I may get a check, and then I get five responses, and I'm like, where in the world do these people come from? You know, do they materialize as we get further in the form? What happens? Tell me who you're with when you go. Um, tell me about the opportunity, how it came about, um, the person, your relationship with that person. And in the other box, please indicate what that is. If it doesn't meet this criteria, please let me know because I keep track of all that. Then tell me about the conversation. Uh, tell me about the person. And again, select one per conversation. So if you had two people um, who had no religious experience at all, put a number two. If you had one person that um, was already saved, then put a one. Okay, so record your conversations that way. Um, then down here we get some more information about uh, the encounter. Did you share your testimony? Last semester I looked at testimonies and the, the numbers skyrocketed when someone shared their testimony of someone coming to faith in Christ. Your testimony is key, so put testimony and gospel in the same conversation. Um, we got a little bit more on the form to go. This is the point where you can write down a decision that was made and then talk about follow-up. On follow-up, I'm not so concerned with um, you know, this conversation, I had this follow-up, this follow-up, this follow-up. I just want a number. If you talk with six people, tell me um, individually how many times you want to follow up with them. Self-evaluation, even though I'm grading over 100 reports and, and Larry's going to be grading a lot of reports, we're going to read these to see how well you're doing so that we can help you individually. So that's pretty much the form. Uh, let me tell you one thing about narratives is just what Dr. Tolbert said. We want some good, concise, concise, did you hear me? Concise um, narratives. I'm not going to read something that's five pages long. I, I don't have time to do that. But I do want to know the transitions, um, how the gospel was shared, what you said, how you met the person, what they said back. We do want to know those things. And last, some of you have, have indicated that you're going out and sharing the gospel by yourself. That's great. This is about church excellence. It's not just about your excellence. So make sure that you bring someone from the church with you if you can. Take your spouse. Take someone in your family with you. When you get home, I do not want myself to, or Larry to be the first people that hear about your gospel conversation. If you are married, share it with your spouse. When I talk with my wife about um, the conversations that I've had, I want her to be the first person to know because I want to pour into her how to share her faith with somebody. So do that. Be intentional about it. Um, know that even though I'm grading you, Dr. Tolbert is grading me. So a little bit of um, accountability for me as well in this. Um, that's pretty much it. Okay. Question. And the form is the same form for graduate and undergraduate. Uh, it's a new form. In fact, we're looking, this is going to probably be a form that we'll use seminary-wide. Uh, supervised ministry may be going to this very same form, so it'll be generally used. It's one a month. It's not a specified week, is it? One a month, no specified week, but one a month for the graduate, and then one time for the undergraduate. I'm going to say it needs to be as personal as possible. I think first preference would be face-to-face, -face, but you've got family, you're talking about like folks in Romania right. that you're going to be talking with over Skype. I think I'm going to allow you to share Jesus over Skype, Andre. I think we're going to we're going to go be good with that. I would say it doesn't need to be email or text message. It needs to be something as personal as possible, though. Yeah, yeah. Is that a question? Okay. Um, for the narrative, I don't care if you use Turabian. If you put footnotes in there, I'm not going to judge you. But um, 
All, all I'm looking for in the narrative is just your conversation. So if you say, um, like if I was writing a narrative and I said Ryan and then I went space by space all the way down through there, that's okay, but I really want it in paragraph form, a narrative, okay? I don't want it line by line itemized um, through the conversation. Does that make sense? Any other questions? All right, um, the question was about Supervised Ministry 1, what do you do uh, to meet our requirements? If you're in the graduate level work and you're doing Supervised Ministry 1, your requirements are already met because you're doing evangelism. What we're asking of you to do is at the end of the semester, send us your work, send us the stuff about evangelism. As we move to using this form or a form like it across the seminary, then that's gonna make it a lot easier, but what I'm asking you to do is just take those forms, put it into this format, and send it to me. It's very, very similar to the format that's already using for Supervised Ministry One. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Let me ask you a question, show of hands. How many of you are a little bit fearful about sharing your faith in Christ personally? Don't lie, be honest, raise your hand, okay? My hand goes up. I want people to know Christ. I want people to be saved, but there is a, there is a little timidity. There's a little bit of fear within us that we have to overcome. But I will tell you, if you will pray, Lord, show me someone, give me someone with whom I can talk, I, it's just incredible. I've just got to, it is incredible to see how God is going to provide those opportunities for you. I started doing this several years ago. I remember going down to breakfast one morning. I had prayed that prayer that morning. Lord, give me someone that I can talk to today. I went in to get breakfast. I was at a hotel there in Atlanta. I was teaching. And there was another lady there in the restaurant reading her Bible. So we struck up a conversation together about the Lord. And while we were talking about the Lord, another lady came over who was working in the restaurant. And she was listening to us. I could tell she was sort of eavesdropping. So I turned to her and I said, excuse me, could I ask you a question? And when I asked this lady that, my friend who was over here reading her Bible, and I just barely heard it, but my friend said, come on. And uh, I don't get a lot of come ons when I preach, but she said, come on. And I felt like saying, I'm coming, you know. So I got to share the gospel with this lady. She was already a Christian, but I got to encourage her in her faith. And I was going back to my room and I was sort of chuckling to myself that this lady had said that to me, that she had said, come on to me. And I, and I remember thinking, I don't think I've ever had that happen before. And the Lord said, oh, I say it to you all the time, but you usually just don't pay any attention to me. There are gonna be times that God is gonna prompt you, I want you to talk to this person, particularly if you've prayed that prayer. Lord, give me someone to talk to. The Lord's gonna say, it's this guy right here. This is the one. I'm answering your prayer right now. This is so you need to you need to just sort of shove yourself across that little threshold of fear. The student that Ryan mentioned that I went out with, we went right over here on Press Drive, just right within the shadow of, of uh, our seminary, and he was so scared. We went to three houses. We had two really good gospel conversations, and so we're going back to the car, and he said, "Dr. Talbert, can I be honest with you?" And I said, "Sure." He said, "I was so scared." Of course, I knew that. And I said, well, can I be honest with you? And he said, yeah. I said, I was scared too. I said, but what we have to do is we just sort of have to shove ourselves across that little threshold of fear. And, and then the next thing you know, we're into the gospel. So we get back to the car. And he said, thank you so much for doing that with me, Dr. Talbert. I said, man, I was so glad to do that. He said, can we do this every week for the next few weeks? I said, absolutely. So we're here to do that with you. We will help you. We will do everything we can to encourage you. This is critically important for your ministry. This is critically important for the kingdom. As Dr. Kelly said, the churches in which you guys serve, that's 75% of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's sort of like one little snowflake might not be that significant, but you put all those snowflakes together, it can close the schools and shut down a city. If every church in the Southern Baptist Convention, like your church, that's 75% of us, started baptizing one person a month, 12 a year, that would change the dynamic of the Southern Baptist Convention. Your church matters. You may not think it does. You may not think it's a significant church, but I wanna promise you, if you are preaching Jesus Christ and you are sharing this precious gospel of Jesus Christ, your church is a significant church. Just by itself, but in terms of mass, 
It's a significant part of who we are as Southern Baptists. So it's important to our seminary. It's important to your education. It's important to the Southern Baptist Convention, what's going on in smaller membership churches. It matters. You matter. You matter to us. We want to be an encouragement to you. The evangelism requirement is a big deal. Take it seriously. Ask the Lord to help you. And as, Ryan, as Dr. Farmer said, really pray that God will lead you in this. I remember years ago, Adrian Rogers said, I can impart truth. I mean, I can proclaim truth, but only the Holy Spirit can impart truth. So we want to ask the Spirit of God to fill us, control us, lead us, and then impart the gospel to the people that we're going to be sharing with. Okay, we're going to stick around and answer questions afterwards, but I'm going to go ahead and close this in a word of prayer. Let me just ask you to bow your head. And I just want to pray for you that God will give you a calmness and a courage and seize those opportunities as you share the gospel this semester. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each one of these students, each one of these ministers whom you have called. I thank you for the context of ministry in which you've placed them. I thank you for those church fields, for those pastoral positions, for those ministry opportunities. Lord, you know every person that's in this program. You know their fears, you know their passions, you know their abilities. And Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon them, that you would make them usable and use them, that they would take up the full armor of God. And as they go out into spiritual warfare to share the gospel, I pray, Lord, that we would really believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But how are they going to believe in whom they've not heard? And how are they going to hear unless someone tells them, unless someone guides them? So, Lord, may we open our mouths and with boldness proclaim the gospel. And then, Holy Spirit, we pray you would impart truth to people's hearts, bring people to faith and repentance. And may we be amazed to see what you will do in and through us this year. So, Father, use us, encourage us, bless us, make us a blessing. And may we be determined to give you all praise, honor, and glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Be sure you sign the sheet before you go. God bless you.